Hello, welcome to part two <laughs> of the Fried Podcast, Saga Night Edition. Uh, I think I said that backwards, actually, but you know what? We're, we're already far gone, but it's okay. All good. I have the second half of Saga Night that is not everyone, obviously, but this is a, another section of Saga Night that is queer identifying. And uh, don't need to introduce myself. So briefly, I'm going to go over everyone else. Lynn, we'll start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Lynn. I am demisexual, uh, biromantic, and non-binary. My pronouns are they, them. And I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about LGBTQ plus stuff, um, mostly asexual, aromantic, and non-binary topics. I'm Ellis. I, uh, my brain isn't working today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I am queer. I usually just say queer because it's easier than having to explain my complicated identity. Um, I am non-binary and my pronouns are he, they. I don't really have a YouTube channel or anything fun like that, but I hang out with Lynn on their YouTube channel sometimes. So, yeah. I'm Robin. Uh, I am non-binary. Wow. Non-binary. <laughs> non-binary. <laughs> I am on the Reciperantic, which is on the ace spectrum, and also I go with the they them pronouns. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the they them. <laughs> the the, the oh, they yeah. them. <laughs> the of that club. Oh no. <laughs> um All right. So, I'm going to start off things a little similar to how we did part 1, but that's just because new people, new stories. Uh, for my introduction, I would just say go on to part one, but my full identity is polyamorous, pansexual, and trans femme. So, I'm gonna go Ellis. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, um, you know, I had inklings growing up that I can look back on and say, oh yeah, like I was queer the whole time. I was non-binary, um, but I didn't really have vocabulary for that kind of stuff growing up because it wasn't something my family talked about at all. Um, it wasn't something I had really experienced with in my environment that I grew up in. Um, I got on the internet when I was a teenager um, and learned on Tumblr all that fun stuff about being trans, being non-binary, being queer in general. Um, and I was always like, you know, that's for other people. That's not, that's not for me. Like, it's okay that you guys are doing it, but like, I, I'm not, I'm not queer or anything like that. Um, I was like 19 when I realized that I was having the same feelings for women as I do for men. Um, and I was, I, I came out to people and I was like, oh yeah, like I, I came out as ace. And then later I came out as bisexual. Um, and I was like, it, it was just, it was weird and rough. Um, I didn't really accept myself until a couple years ago at the beginning of the pandemic when I realized that I was also arom aromantic um, because that was like the thing that I was like, oh my God, I really am queer. Oh no. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so that was like the thing that made me really confront it with myself. And then um, my gender identity looking, it's another thing where I can look back and see signs of it from when I was young. Um, but I, I really remember one day I was just sitting there, like, I think I was just like cleaning my room or something. I like had that thought pop in my head, like, oh yeah, it'd be cool if like, you know, my body looked a certain way. And then I realized, I was like, you know what? I don't think cisgender women feel this way about their bodies. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they want that, you know, the, the anatomy changes that I want. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been a wild ride. Um, but I, I feel like I'm finally in a place where I can like accept myself and love myself for who I am and be comfortable with my identities, even as, you know, I'm still trying to figure things out on in certain areas, but at the same time, like I'm feeling more comfortable with just being queer and with my gender identity and exploring what that means for me. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm, 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 that's, uh, we're going to touch upon some of the few things you said uh, earlier, but uh, right now I'm going to switch it up and we're going to go to Rowan. Who is muted, by the way. 
Like, oh, please. I'm old boss today. It's okay. We're getting through. It's a no. It's a normal disker call with me being muted. Let's go. <laughs> the background noises are too loud. But um, I think for me, it started like growing up in a very religious and Catholic Mexican household and stuff like that. I think it was really hard to explore those gender identities, especially like with all my cousins and everything, like, you have to be presenting high fem constantly because that is the standard in our culture and stuff like that. I wouldn't say, like, it's a full standard, but that is just how it was ingrained in my head. Like, if I wasn't fully high fem, then, like, you're basically an ugly girl in the sense of, like, that's how, like, people would be like. And I was just, like, growing up, I was never interested into, like, big high fem stuff. I was just like, I'm not a fan of wearing super cute jewelries i'm not a fan of low-cut dresses and stuff like that so like growing up it was really hard for me and i didn't have any of those spaces to connect with because i wasn't fully on the internet as much as people were when they were like 13 to 14 like i would see people at the library and they would like that was where i would be connecting to like the queer spaces like i knew lesbians and like gays and stuff like that but i was just like that's not where i am so i'm like where do i fit in and then going into college and everything, I found out, honestly, through Quinn and Lynn being like, oh, there are other A spaces that you can be in. And I'm just like, yeah, because I don't fit in any of these spaces. Like, I'm gender fluid, can be, but I really don't have a design anything. And just being more in my 20s, I figured it mostly out and stuff like that. I'm still going through the curves, but... Yeah, just growing up, it was just really hard for me to, because I just found, like, I'm not normal like the rest of my family is. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like I'm, I can accept myself for who I am. I'm proud of who I am. And, like, you know, don't go to be conforming to the people. <laughs> just make yourself happy. Honest to God. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Hello. Um, so I'll <laughs> go for... The ace and bi first, and then I'll go for the non-binary. Um, I apparently was told by Ellis when I was 14 <laughs> that, uh, that, that I was asexual. <laughs> and I, don't remember, I, don't, I don't remember that whatsoever, uh, but I completely believe that it happened. Um, uh, I just never really felt the same way that a lot of the other people that I was around was starting to feel, um, like everyone was getting crushes and I was like, um, what are, is this fake? What's going on? It's like, this is sure. This is real, but okay. Uh, y'all do you. Um, and then I had a friend of mine who is also on the asexual spectrum and she told me about it when I was like 15, 16. When did I, I want to say somewhere around there. Um, so I started looking into it, again, mostly on Tumblr and online, um, and I found the label demisexual, um, probably when I was 17, and that's when I kind of figured out that I actually had had a crush or two before, and the very first one I had was on my female best friend at the time, and I was like, oh, let's not deal with that right now. I'll say I'm biromantic, but uh, that that's it. That's the only one. I'm not going to deal with this. Um, so identifying as like biromantic has definitely been like the hardest thing for me because again, as a Mormon growing up, you're told, you know, it's wrong, it's sinful, and it's not something that you're allowed to do. So it definitely internalized a lot more of the biphobia and the homophobia. Um, and I only recently, within the last, like, probably the pandemic, have, like, really worked on that. And it's like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> like, you're good. Um, so, yeah, I figured out my sexuality and romantic orientation first. And then when I met you... And kind of, like, your origin story about, like, realizing your sexuality. I just remember being so angry that, like, you were non-binary and being like, why am I so jealous of this person? Like, they seem so happy and just, like, I was like, a lot of the things you told me about, I was like, that's me, but, like, I don't want to feel like I'm copying this new person that I just met. <laughs> like, I don't want to, like, seem like that. So I first identified as gender fluid, um, which at the time I do genuinely think was a, a good label for um, me and kind of 
I don't want to say it was like dipping my toes into like gender and that kind of stuff, but I I was okay at the time with more um, pronouns than I am right now. Um, and then <laughs> around, <laughs> I know, sorry, he looks like a little ghost. Um, and then it was around the pandemic that I was like, you know what, I I think they them pronouns is what's best for me and makes me feel the most comfortable. Um, and for a little while, I was like, oh, it can be gender fluid and only use, like, they, them pronouns. Like, that is valid, by the way. Um, but I slowly realized, like, just the umbrella of non-binary fit me a little bit better. And I would say my gender has become a little bit more stagnant. Um, and much like Ellis for, like, gender identity, like, I can look back on, like, my childhood very distinctly and be like, okay, that's where... That's where it all it all was there. I just didn't have the language to to put to it at the time, and I'm very grateful that I was able to uh, find people um, to help me discover that language. Yeah, there's a there's a common theme behind a lot of um, listening to everyone's origin story, so to say. Um, it seems that the there's a key word that a lot of you say in your origin stories, myself included, which is childhood. Like, it really, really cements the fact that children are probably having these thoughts and can't convey them in a way that, you know, maybe they're able to now, or if they were in a better environment or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We have this lovely line between us, not only on Discord, but uh, above you have, you know, Mormon have a white family that is well for you guys specifically half of your family is more accepting of who you are than other and then you have the bottom half which is catholics hispanics and we don't have that acceptance this also mm. happened in a previous episode that the, there were there was a i'm fine still divide. dead named we hate that yeah like we we deal with being dead named being misgendered and yeah and the constant of I'm I'm sure I'm not gonna speak for Rowan, but I know for myself I get the constant, you know, like you're gonna be a man of the house someday and you're gonna be a father and all these really gross expectations that I absolutely don't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. so well, my, my question is, and anyone can jump in to answer, is what resources do you think kids need that can help them just talk about these things, not necessarily like, you know, here's your identity stamp and like they leave, but just something that would be beneficial to their growth as a person because yeah. identity is important no matter if you're queer or straight. It's just mm -hmm. important to have a sense of who you are and what you plan to do, how you plan to live. So where do we start? Um, so as someone who loves to read and who works in a library, um, I think books are a great way to start. Um, there are lots of books nowadays about different types of families, different identities, um, different ways to like, it's not even like, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to say it. Um, it's like very age appropriate books. Like you have like little, little picture books that like you can read to your toddler or your baby. Um, the little, like little board books, you have like picture books for the older kids. Um, and then you have like, you know, stuff like Percy Jackson um, and the spinoff series for that. Um, that's just the first one I thought of off the top of my head that had like queer characters in it. Yeah. Um, but just like casual representation, like you have books where people are like, this is a mommy, this is a daddy. And just stuff like that, where you can give kids the vocabulary to describe what their experience is, no matter what that experience is. Um, mm -hmm. And just starting, like, building blocks there. Um, and also, like, building a community where you can discuss these kinds of things. Um, I know Rowan talked about going to the library. I love libraries. <laughs> I love yeah. libraries. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's where I got all of, like, my information and everything. We're, like, libraries. Like, go reading comic books, manga, stuff like that. And, like, even just, like, news articles of, like, you know how it was, yeah. like, 
just even like even seeing like the homophobia in like some of those articles is like yeah. some like it made me understand some of the things of why people were hating on it, but also made me not understand. It's just like why, like yeah. why are you so unaccepting and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, I definitely think R- Ellis is onto something with like age appropriate uh, mm-hmm. representation. I don't think kids need to explicitly know anything other than. A man and a man can love each other. A, a woman and a woman can love each other. There are people who are not a man or a woman, or someone who was raised as a boy can now become a woman, or someone who was raised as a girl can become a man now. It doesn't need to be as explicit as people are thinking that kids are being taught. Like, I know they're like weird circumstance. Like they're always an exception to that, but like I don't think it needs to be more than that until like a certain age when you know kids start to want more of the vocabulary and to mm-hmm. understand more. So like probably sixth, seventh, eighth grade would be more appropriate to talk about some of the more in depth stuff. But Rowan knows a whole lot more about you've worked with kids, so you yeah. know. Yeah. So I do have a personal experience with the kid that I nanny for. Mm. Uh, he was telling me the other day. I think it was just an unironic thing, but it's also like hmm, maybe he was telling me how he's like, I don't want to wear this certain type of shirt because my mom said it was a girl shirt. Mm-hmm. It makes me look like a girl. But he told me the other day he's like, I don't want to cut my hair. I want to have my hair long. Yeah. Like the other girls, and I'm just like, see, like if we keep labeling things like this is gender. Yeah. You're assigning fake objects to their genders. That's what's making these kids be like, oh, well, I can't do this because my parents told me it's this. Yeah. When in reality, the parents would be like, it's just a piece of clothing. You can wear whatever you want. Your hair cell mm-hmm. can be whatever you want. Yep. Because the other day he saw a woman on TV who had a pixie cut. He's just like, why does she have a boy haircut? She looks yeah. really cute and pretty. But why does she have a boy haircut? Mm-hmm. It's like, because she is allowed to. It's her hair. It's what she wants to do. Yeah. And like, Actually, like, for me to, like, first see my first, like, same-gender couple on a TV show was, unironically, Clarence (laughs) with the two moms. So that was my first, like, big, like, oh, there are actually people who, like, are queer and can fall in love. And it wasn't anything, like, gross. It's just like, yeah, these are my two moms. Next episode. It was that simple. And it's like, okay, that's great. So, Yeah. Yeah. Like, for kids, you don't have to be like, oh, well, like, same-sex people do, you know, sexual stuff. It doesn't yeah. have to be like that. That's the problem. Yeah. Like, old media will raunch it up. And that's yeah. why, you know, like, people, homophobia and stuff like that. It's just like, well, like, all these people are just only for sexual attention and, like, overly sexualized. That's what the LGBT community is all about. They're fetishizing it. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not just fetishes. Yeah. yeah. It's literally people mm-hmm. being in love with each other. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know when I was still going to church, I taught the, like, the little kids lessons, mm-hmm. um, and I had this little girl, I had short hair at the time, my hair is longer now, but yeah. um, at the time, I had, like, a pixie cut, basically, and this girl was like, why do you have a boy, same thing, why do you have a boy's yeah. haircut, and I was, and, you know, you don't have to get into the whole, like, at the time, I still identified as a woman, but, like, if I had been identifying as non-binary, you don't have to get into, like, the whole, you know, oh, there's a spectrum of ball, you can just yeah. say, like, well, hair hair can be short hair can be on people who look like women and long hair can be on people who look like men. Like Mm -hmm. anybody can have their hair, however they want to have it. Like Mm -hmm. you don't need to get into a whole, like, Oh, these are the chromosomes and the spectrum. Yeah. It's just like, this is how I like my hair. You can have simple conversations with kids that like, help them to start understanding it's like you're not going to sit a five-year-old down and start teaching them like advanced calculus or physics and things like that like <laughs> literally like, you start with one plus one equals two in fact mm-hmm. you start with yeah. counting before you even start with adding things like yeah mm-hmm. people are i feel like people are so quick to be like oh well you want to teach them all about like gay sex and like the the like as like explicit aspects of transitioning and things like that it's like no we just want to teach them what will help them to build the foundation to Mm -hmm. have the vocabulary so that they can describe themselves growing up and even like, and to feel comfortable with our identities. Like even if you are, um, 
like cisgender and heterosexual, like it's still important to have that vocabulary and yeah. to deconstruct those gender roles that are so, and like the heteronormativity, the cisnormativity that's so ingrained in society because it harms everybody. It does. And so like, it's something that even like cisgender heterosexual people need to know in order to like help, ev- help like everybody get a healthier ass, like healthier look at life and stuff like that. So 100%. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very it's so <laughs> it's really interesting to me how much sex has an effect on everything. Like it's it's one of the most yeah. it's an act of intimacy between, you know, two people or more, but mostly two people <laughs> and <laughs> it's that action depicts it's like, it's an umbrella. It's like underneath all of that is like everything, gender, orientation, and romance. All this stuff exists underneath it, and it's so jarring to me that you know sex is like up here in terms of like yeah. the umbrella, and then being a child is all the way down here, basically the hook of the umbrella. So you can't. There's so much distance between the two before, like, a child can even learn about any of those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. And if you're a parent that talks about birds and bees to a child, you're weird. Oh, 100%. That's just... Yeah. yeah. Why? Don't even do it. Yeah, it's really strange. <laughs> you're weirder than these queers. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but there is no adult out there that needs to be concerned about what goes on behind the bedrooms of two other adults that have consent with each other. Yep. Yeah. This is really strange. I also, I said this a while back, but um, I think it might have been mentioned previously because V brought up some point, but a, lot, a part of me was just kind of like, you know, they, can, they kind of teach kids like genocide at a young age. They for do. Example, Columbus Day. Like, yep. Christopher Columbus yeah. is a horrible, awful person. Yep. who has done heinous things to Native Americans. But, you know, when when Columbus Day rolls around, they try to, they really try to pump up the story, and they're like, yeah, he found America. No one else was here, except for some Indians. But no one else was here, and it's, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible phrasing. It's horrible wording. They Need also, to... like... Oh, sorry. Well, they I'm also, say, like, but... play down slavery as well. Like, they just play everything <laughs> down to make themselves so, like, look better. America <laughs> did nothing wrong. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 wasn't, wrong. it wasn't that bad. You know, we could put some duct tape on it. It'll be fine. Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, if you can water down horrific events such as those two, mm-hmm. then you can water They're down, bad. like, people identifying a different way because that's all it is at the end of the day you're just identifying a different way yeah yeah it's like it's like so like the the example that popped into my head is like if you grow up christian and your kid encounters let's say someone who's jewish for the first time you're not gonna be like oh you want to learn about judaism go read the talmud like you're not gonna do that to a kid like it's it's one of those things where it's like, okay, like this person believes differently than us. These are kind of like the basics of what they believe. And as you're older, if you're interested, you can get more into it, but like, you're not going to slam like thousands of years worth of, um, worth of, um, what's the word? It's not philosophy. Um, religious, religious belief, religious teachings, like in five seconds on someone who is not prepared to learn about it like yeah you, you gotta start slow it's it's the um i hate to bring scripture into it but it's the whole milk before meat thing you know like you're not gonna you're not gonna like sit a baby down at a like a five course meal and be like here eat it when they don't even have teeth you know <laughs> i like that it's a it's a pretty funny imagery just imagining, like, baby in that chair and there's like a ribeye steak I'd be like, no, this is mine. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, Please. No, I'm I'm not not for <laughs> Straight up. I have some Cheerios. This is expensive. <laughs> this is a Wagyu. Please. <laughs> Wagyu on a salt rock plate. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, I'm hungry. Stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm hungry now, too. Yeah. So... We all have religious upbringing. Oof. It is. Yeah. Oof. This was unavoidable. The minute I saw like what the <laughs> roster was for the weekend people, I was like, this is going to be unavoidable. The trauma, let's go. <laughs> Without 
too much like trauma <laughs> dumping. Why do you believe that? Maybe I'll go with Rowan first. So we both grew up Catholic. We both went to the same church. Um, why do you believe? And I guess this is also going to touch on our culture. But why, in our culture as Hispanics, do you believe that queer people are viewed the way they are? Our, uh, you know, how we like talk, we effeminate, and we have a specific way of saying things. Like these things are specifically said in a feminine way. These things are specifically said in a masculine way. It's just how the language is. You know yeah. how it is. Like, you can't break that apart. There's no it that it's always just a specific feminine or masculine way. And being Mexican myself, because I think it might be a little bit different for Peruvian culture, but I'm not entirely sure. Just Hispanic culture in general. Um, it's still that big stigmatism of the man is in charge of everything. Like, how your parents unfortunately view you. You're the man. Gross. Uh, it's it's just gross saying it like that too. Like in a Hispanic, like your parents believe you are the man of the house. You strictly have to do all these manly things. Like there's nothing. And as myself being female of the family, and and I think because I am the eldest, I'm held at a certain different caliber. It's just like you are this. You have to be the standard, no, like the exemplary female. Hispanic, like you have to be perfect at everything. You have to like, you have to always look presentable. If you look even like shaggy, like right now I'm shaggy. If like my mom saw me, she'd be like, "You're shaggy. You need to have your hair like straightened. You need to be wearing makeup." Like we just got our nails done, but that's because I like getting my nails done. Like you're not presenting high fem. Like you're not wearing something. Like if we were to go out, you're not wearing something that would you were worthy of going out. You're looking hodonga, which means you look trashy. Oh. Yeah, like it's really bad, and I think because like in our church as well, because of that stigmatism where you have to present yourself in a certain way, our church was also very very non-Catholic, as you would say. Mm -hmm. Like they, it was more like a fashion show than it was going to church. Oh no, we were going yeah. to. <laughs> oh, like even like our like uh, priests would always be like, "Women, you need to stop wearing these like trashy dresses because this is a church. Ooh. Like this isn't." A nightclub. That's how our priest would say. Like, it was really bad growing up. Oof. Mm -hmm. Dang. Yeah. Um, it's, it, so, talking it from a Peruvian perspective, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty similar. I mean, yeah, all Hispanics, um, especially in our, <laughs> country, <laughs> in our country of origin, um, everything feels, like, super standard over there. Like, like it feels like, and with this is this is my knowledge of Peru back when I was eighteen. Is the last time I went to Peru, um, but from what I remember, a lot of things were just very cut and dry, very old fashioned. You know, men do this, women do that, and there was never a, there was never. I actually don't even recall seeing any hint of queerness in my in my country. Not one. Like I didn't see pride flags. I didn't see, not even queer looking people. Everyone was just like kind of ordinary. It was a little creepy actually. It was such a jarring experience coming back to the States and then like I see like rainbow flags and I see like, you know, stereotypically gay people. But um in in a house, my parents, without getting a little too personal, but a lot of the times when they lecture me about like things I'm going through or things they're looking at, they're like, that's wrong. But any of those points, it's always, and they always nail it down. They're always like, it's remember, you're a man. You have to, you have to strengthen up. You have to bulk up. You have to go through everything. You have to be strong for your future wife and kids. It's this, it's a constant, it's really jarred into yeah. you. That was being told this since I was five and being five years old, being lot. told that you're going to, yeah. <laughs> like being five and being told like, you're going to have a wife and kids. You almost kind of believe them. Like you're almost brainwashed mm -hmm. into being like, yeah, yeah, like, oh yeah, when I when I become an adult, I'm gonna meet a woman and we're gonna have kids and that's gonna be my life. Yeah, and that's exactly what I thought too. Like I, oh sorry, like is it okay if I? Yeah, you're fine. No, I distinctly remember 
I don't know how old I was, probably about five or six, in a car ride thinking about like my wedding day and like what the man would be and how many kids we would have just because growing up in the church that we grew up in, Mormonism, from like four or five, they tell you, you get married, you find a man or a, or a woman, you go get married in the temple and you start having kids like immediately. Like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like like that. If you don't have a kid within, like, a year, year and a half of getting married, like, they're like, are you okay? Is everything fine? Yeah. Like, yeah. is yeah. something wrong? I... Like, you need help? Like, <laughs> Yeah. When I was on my mission, I actually talked to a guy whose wife left because they had infertility issues, and she had been bugged so much at church about having kids that she just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and she was like, I'm, I can't have people asking me when we're going to have kids anymore. It was just so upsetting for her. It's traumatic. Yeah. Especially yeah. I, uh, if someone wants to have kids. Yeah, I'm 27, and I'm already too old for my culture. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not married. Like, Isaiah and I just recently started dating a year ago. Like, they're already asking, like, when's the wedding? When is When are the kids? And I'm just like, stop. What? Enough. Yeah. I don't want that yet. Like, eventually, yeah. maybe, yeah. And stuff yeah. like that. But, like, it's not something you force your partner and everything. Yeah. And, like, that's something you have to discuss. But because of the culture that I grew up in, like, yeah, like how Lynn was saying, at five years old, you get ingrained, like yeah. having that conversation. Like at five, I was learning how to cook, how to clean, how to be the perfect housewife. That's what the women are in like Mexican, oh. like Hispanic cultures. You're basically being trained to be the perfect housewife. Yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. like relate to that. And especially because in Mormonism, at the age of 12, you get split off into young men and young women. And like my very first, so we had like an extra day that we would go do like youth group or whatever called mutual um and my very first lesson as like a 12 year old was like the law of chastity chastity which is essentially like don't have sex don't do anything until you're married to a man don't even think about thinking don't about think it don't think about it and i like me my little ace self i was <laughs> like oh you're talking about it while you're talking about it i was it. like I'm asexual, like, little ace me was like, why are we even having this conversation? Do people actually think about this? Like, I don't, like, I, I honestly didn't even realize for a little bit that I was ace because I was taught that you, no one thought about sex. Even though we were taught about sex so much in Mormonism. Yeah. It's such, like, a weird, I don't even know how to describe it. They don't want you to have... It's a hyper fit. They yeah. don't want you to have sex. But as soon as you get married, they want you to start popping off like that. And I know that a lot of people who are in those like higher demand religions where you're not able to do anything physical with your partner until you're married have a lot of shame after being married having sex because they're like, I've been told my whole life I cannot do this. So when you're actually able to have it, you're like, oh, my God, what 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 is this? I, I it's not what I expected, and a lot of the times it can hurt for the person with female anatomy, and, like, it's just not always a good thing, and it's, it, the control of sexuality bothers me so much, specifically in Mormonism, because it doesn't allow you to actually express yourself, and it also makes for very short marriages and people only wanting to get married because yeah. they want to have sex with, like, a friend of mine literally went to BYUI, um, and she would tell me about people who would go, go to Vegas, get, like, a weekend marriage just to have sex, and then come back up divorced, because you're able to do those ceremonies and, like, divorce so quickly in Vegas, and they, because they just wanted to have sex and didn't want to be, um, sinful or, um, not worthy to go to the temple or anything. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I think, especially in like mormonism and stuff it also like the whole thing with mormonism is like we're not the same as everybody else we're not the yeah. same kind of church as everybody else we don't have the same teachings our teachings are all unique and stuff like that and it's really funny because like the church when it was being founded and moving forward even to this day absorbed so much of the conservative like conservative teachings of like evangelical churches and stuff like 100%. that that it's it's ridiculous like if they really wanted to be unique they would be like having same-sex marriages in the temples and things yeah, like that right? like oh god um the sorry i was like trying to think while i was listening and it's not working um but it's so weird because like 
for me, the whole thing with sexuality in the church and like queerness in the church is like it started out as like a hey, everybody hates everybody else hates queer people. This is back in like the 1800s where it just wasn't acceptable in like this area of um, America. And it was just the thing to do. Like you just didn't do it. And it evolved from there into like conversion therapy and mixed orientation marriages. Like the church really, really pushed the whole, it's a disease of the mind, like addiction. Like you can overcome this if you pray hard enough, if you marry the, if you marry a, like for men, like if you marry a woman and you're faithful and you read your scriptures and you pray every day, you can overcome this. Like gender stuff wasn't even really a thing, I think, until like the family proclamation came out and was like, oh, well, man and woman are an eternal thing. It's like, well, y'all didn't even care like five, ten years ago about gender and things like that. Did not like not even mentioned. And the thing that really sorry, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. But for me, the gendered aspect of it also was like that really still is like kind of triggering for me, honestly, is modesty. Yep. Like the church's attitude around surrounding modesty, especially with women and like AFAB people. Um, if you appear to be as a woman, you like all the blame for any man's sexual thoughts or behaviors are on you. Can I, can I interrupt yes. real quick? I distinctly remember, remember how mom used to have us in like the back row? Yeah. At, so I distinctly remember one Sunday, like, I was being rowdy, I was in a dress, like, and I was just playing. I was literally just playing on the pew, and I think my skirt was, like, hiked up or my legs were open. I was, like, five or six at the time, and my mom literally was like, Lynn, close your legs, you don't want the bishop to see up your skirt. And I'm like, like, even then I was like, what the, like, what the fuck? But, like, even, like, now as an adult, I'm like, my mom should have been like hey honey like you know let's be quiet or whatever or taking me outside but don't put the blame on me if a grown-ass man at the front of the church is looking at my skirt as like a five or six year old i'm like thinking back on it i was like that's actually like so fun and like i used i hated that stuff like i remember like as a kid i hated having shirts on that's one of the things that i like never understood when my brother had um like friends over um who my brother's like eight years older so they were teenagers when we were kids my mom would be like you have to have a shirt on and i was like well why can't i just run a ret like why can't i just be like be <laughs> why do i have to cover my body because at that time i was like i look like a little boy and i've seen little boys just run around the house in shorts and like they don't get told to put a shirt on. Like, I couldn't comprehend why I was being told something different than, like, the boys my age. It pissed me off. Like, that was always something that, like, bothered me. No, I have a similar experience like you as well, Lynn, with, like, yeah. family members. And, like, I would get the comments from, like, the moms and aunts. It's like, yeah. their family. Why do I have to, like, mm-hmm. I view them as, like, fathers as well. Like, why are you yeah. telling me that they're going to view me in a really disgusting way? Yeah. That, like, was just, like, traumatizing as well as a child it's just like so any person family or not is just going to view me as an object yeah which is what i also hate about like cis conforming stuff like it's just like yeah. you're just viewed as an object which 100%. is like percent gross and it i is... think like queerness in the church is so interesting because um polygamy is a really hot topic in mormonism and mormon adjacent sure. spaces but like it was not heteronormative. Like, it was because it was enforcing the patriarchy, and a lot of it was, like, not very consensual, but at the same time, like, it was not what everybody else was doing. And so you'd think, like, you'd think a church with that kind of a background would have a little more empathy towards people who are not doing what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And it's just not. And, like, the gender roles are enforced, like, so strictly. And I literally had somebody on my mission be like, I can't even remember exactly what he said, but he was just like, oh yeah, women have like special abilities to deal with like emotional stuff or whatever. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, what, what are you, what are you saying? And how that just extends to like, (sighs) it extends to everything. And it's also so much the amount of like, 
especially in Mormonism, because of what they're taught, men have such God complexes, and you yes. have to refer to the man, like, it always goes back to a man is higher up than you. And that's yeah. another thing that I never understood. I was like, why is this man between me and God that supposedly, like, knows me and loves me and that kind of stuff? I feel it's like just... we've gotten into... Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I feel like we've, we've just gotten into a rant about religion. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, mean, I, I saw I saw that coming a mile away, but I do have a question for Ro though. So I know that uh, Sumi talked about like um, not seeing a lot of queer people in Peru, and I know there are probably I know there are queer people in Peru. Like that that's a thing. Mm-hmm. You've been to Mexico recently. What's the queer like community like in Mexico? None. Really, non-existent. Really, there, I did have a hairdresser. The thing is, I couldn't tell. Like, they were the exaggerated caricature Mm. of, like, how my aunt said. She's like, this is a transvestite. Mm. Oh. Like, yeah. Like, like, how would you imagine, like, a characterized, like, Latin transvestite? You know from Chu Wong Fu? Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Imagine that Latin. I love love his name. I loved her though. Yeah, I Chi, want to say Chi, 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 but that's the name of who we played Chi. in. Um, I think it was Chi Chi. Never seen Chi Chi. Okay, imagine oh her ten times. Oh my before. god, that's how my hairdresser was, and wow. I was just like, and like, um, she probably had she, to be like that though. She would talk so raunchy too. So I'm just like, mm-hmm. it's just like that was like the only like queer person I ever saw on that trip because everybody else is like they all have kids they're all married or they're all yeah. single and they're all like drunk cowboys yeah how many people like in Hispanic culture do you genuinely think are probably queer or have experienced like same I don't want to say same sex attraction because like that feels so outdated but like have experienced attraction to the same gender and just have to fight it because of these enforced um social constructs that honestly came about because of colonialism and um like the colonization of the spaniards and english bringing catholicism over mm-hmm. to america because i, think- I know i know there were like other genders here before mm-hmm. white pe- white people <laughs> well i vaguely heard from like uh like a documentary that there's like a specific uh population in mexico Mm-hmm. Where they're all like non-binary, like they're ace. Really? They don't, they don't have, like they don't say they don't have genders, but they're just like everybody does everything equally. Like yeah. there's no, yeah. you are this to be doing that and stuff like that. So I think it's just, yeah. it's hard, you know, like because you know I'm also in like a cis presenting relationship. Like mm-hmm. Isaiah's hetero. Like I'm the queer one in the relationship and stuff like yeah. that. So it's like still like ingrained <laughs> in my mind. Like you still have to be married to mm-hmm. a male and stuff like that but like at the end of the day it's just like he's my partner i like really like him a lot and stuff like that so it's just like it doesn't matter to me who i'm with like at the end of the day if like no one can accept it like i'm gonna be happy no matter what gotcha but um i don't know how many people are like not questioning because like you can tell that i'm literally americanized queer gotcha yeah like my hairdresser that was when i still had my undercut oh yeah and he was just like (laughs) He's like you. No, I'm yeah, just like yeah. you. Really, you. Really, you. <laughs> <laughs> guns, the five like, guns. That's the thing. It's like they, he kind of knew, but it's just like other people just been like, "Why did you do yourself such a crazy haircut? Like, why did yeah. you? Why like yeah. that doesn't look good on you?" It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> bye. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Sumi? What do you What do you think? Honestly, I feel like the washing is so like harsh that on it. A lot of my family's painfully straight, and a lot of people yeah. I saw in in Peru had a very like painfully straight like outlook. They yeah, didn't really, there wasn't really any kind of um. Yeah, no, it was like every every person I met is has always been like, but I mean they're family, right? So it's not like I'm really yeah. thinking about mm-hmm. like, oh, you could potentially be queer or whatever. But for the most part, um. Everyone was, you know, a man, a man, a woman, a woman. The only person mm. who I met that was like that looked very comfortable in his gender and sexuality that he wasn't afraid to give affection to other men was my uncle Ochano. Oh, my yeah. Chano, 
was someone who when he met me he didn't like usually when you greet like there are greetings in the Hispanic mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. a man on man has to be a handshake man on woman has to be a kiss on the cheek yeah or not. Yeah. Um, he kissed me on the cheek and I wasn't ready for that I was like oh shit and he gave me like a really like big embrace he was like Aww. I love you your family Aww. like I'm so happy I'm seeing you right now and you're an adult and I was like oh okay cool he was the only person who I was just kind of like, okay, you restored my faith in men a little bit. Yeah. Because the rest of the country was, you know, rugged. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And, like, a big thing in, like, Hispanic cultures, like, they will literally disown you. That's the thing. It's a big, like, you are not welcome in this family if you're not what we want you to be. I'm sorry. Like, when I first told my parents about, like, this is my identity, this is what I want my name to be, they're like, we don't get it. They still don't get it. They have that headspace of the homophobia where it's like queer people have diseases. Yeah. Because of the AIDS pandemic and stuff like that. Like, yeah, gay yeah. people carry AIDS. That's what their mentality is. Yeah. Like, no matter how many times I correct them of obviously Lynn and Quinn's names, Ellis's yeah. names, they will still dead name everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's just, they just, it's so ingrained in their minds that it's just like, no, this is wrong. Yeah. Mm hmm. Which I is just, like sad. So Mm -hmm. now you can continue i was just thinking of that talk that i think it was elder oaks gave elder oaks is um for anyone who doesn't know very high up in the mormon church and gives a lot of homophobic and transphobic talks i think it was him who was talking about it once who was like talking about having like someone asked him basically like what do i do if i have a queer family member like if someone wants to like bring their partner home to like visit or whatever and he was like well like they can come home but like you're they're not sleeping under your roof you're not introducing them to your friends. You're not going to do anything that's going to make them feel welcome in their lifestyle or what, however he said it. And it just like, if you, I know like people in general, Mormons are, I would say somewhat more progressive out here away from Utah. It's a mixed bag, but like, I would say in general, more progressive out here than in Utah. But like, I've heard stories of people just being like, yeah, like my family kicked me out. Like yeah. the, I think it's like 40% of the queer homeless youth in like the Salt Lake City, Utah area is queer. Yeah. Like 40% of them sense. are queer because these people come out to their families and they're just like, no, like I love God more than I love you. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the commandments by, by kicking you out. I don't want you to influence my kid your your siblings. I don't want you to influence anybody in this house. We can't have you here. And I know I've been very, very lucky that yeah. that hasn't been my personal experience, but I, I know that other people have had that experience and it's, it's just so frustrating. And it's heartbreaking. A, a church that is very family oriented and you hear that as a kid, like it's all family, you're going to be with your family forever, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you're not who they want you to be or you're trying to be your authentic self. They're like, oh, you're not, like, the rest of us, bye, Kick, kicked yeah. out. You're not allowed here anymore, and you're not going to be with your family because of something that you naturally are. It's yeah. it's so gross to me. It sucks when the facade all wears off the minute that you're anything. Yeah. yeah. And I think, like, going back to the original question that you asked about, like, how, why we think our our why we think like the queer community is treated the way it is in our churches like i think it's because like they feel threatened by us like it you have to and like i had this i had the same issue when like i was realizing that i was really queer and like i couldn't just pretend to be straight for the rest of my life um like you have to challenge the whole mindset you were raised with and that is freaking scary for a lot of people and so it's easier And like, and like, you have to challenge not only your mindset, but like, especially when like you grow up with a church that's teaching these things, you have to challenge what you were raised with, like how you were raised, the person you were raised to be and the future you were raised to have. And it, it like, it's threatening. It feels like, like a danger to your safety, to your stability, because it, it just, it challenges everything. And that can feel very dangerous and very upsetting for a lot of people. Um, and I think that's probably why, at least in Mormonism, I think that's one big reason why 
um, the queer community is treated the way it is is because 100%. there's this status quo. And if you challenge the status quo, then you have to challenge everything else that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Love thy neighbor, but not if yeah. they're queer. Straight up. <laughs> All right, trying to move us along from religious Sorry. things. I know it's fine. <laughs> we can go on for hours. We actually yeah, really could go on for hours. Just this. Yeah, really I'm just a religious trauma. <laughs> In terms of you know, culture and uh, wonderful stuff, I'm going to shift into a different kind of culture, which is pop culture. Hell so, yeah. Um, I'm actually going to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, than the previous one. So in the previous one, I talked about fandoms and all the influences shows have on children and mm -hmm. us, necessarily, because we still participate in some of these shows. Even though they're intended for kids, we still watch them, Amphibia, Owl she House, does. whatever. she Um, I actually want to talk about a space that uh, I know at least one of you or two of you will be excited about, but I'm going to talk about social media. Mm -hmm. One hey. of the sites being Tumblr. Ah. <laughs> so, growing up, uh, many of us have used Tumblr in and out. And for those of you that don't know what Tumblr is, because they knock themselves <laughs> after a certain controversy. Oh my god. Um, are we this old? Yeah, I know. Stop. I know. We are We're very dating old. Ourselves. Stop. But Tumblr was a social media in which you could, yeah, it's basically for everything. It was sharing. It was a blog. Yeah. It was sharing, like, you had a blog and. People would post things, and if you liked what they posted, you can actually repost from them as well. And there's no one really here to talk about what my social media growing up, which was Reddit. But mm -hmm. I did have some use with Tumblr, so we're going to start with Tumblr first. Nope. But in terms of queerness, a lot of people pinpoint Tumblr so hard that, you know, back a few years ago, not really so much now, but back then, if you were called a Tumblr user or someone said you look like a Tumblr user, that was supposed to be an insult. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you run a Tumblr blog? Oh my you god. You run a whole Tumblr. Tumblr blog. You did, wait, did you have, how many, how many uh, follows did you have? You had a I decent had, I following. I had 8,000 followings. On yeah, my you had a page. good a good yeah. following i was a tumblr addict <laughs> and i had multiple tumblr accounts because i would rp on tumblr yeah, yeah. and yikes <laughs> <laughs> they're like i'm flashback <laughs> i rp'd the homestuck fandom the hitalia fandom oh, oh my god Titan. Oof. Stop. so was, yeah <laughs> in terms of you know we're gonna start with tumblr um do you agree with the 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 hallmark that that Tumblr has been given of being the queer space, like do you really think that a lot of queer people originated from Tumblr, or that at least that it spread the idea, uh, much more effectively than most sites? I think that it was one of the very first resources and places that you could easily find out about um queerness and queer labels. There were a. I just remember like so many labels being there, and I was like, "What? What is all of this?" And like wanting to learn and wanting to figure out like what I was. I think, especially our generation, I would say between like ninety three to like two thousand, and growing up with the internet and just having that childhood of like technology just moving so quickly and being like all of this new information. We just have this urge to learn and to take in everything that I'm not sure other generations before us had. Um, and I think Tumblr was genuinely a, a product of its time. And I think it was like the first place that a lot of, it was anonymous. You could, you could genuinely be anonymous on it. So you could talk about queer stuff that you couldn't talk about in person. You could have friends online and talk about that stuff with them and like low-key just be like okay this is my online space and I don't necessarily have to relate it back to like my my real life because you know 
you're not out and it's easier to talk to people online than it is people who know you and see you every day at school and that kind of stuff and you don't know if they're going to judge you or not. Um, I think also the rise of like a lot of um, MLM like ships and stuff helped with that a lot. I definitely know that like, you know, um, John Locke and uh, fucking what's Destiel, um, and, Destiel and, and Steric and like everyone kind of like just shipping these guys which oh my god we were queer baited so bad but it's okay um it i don't want to say it popularized the queer community but i definitely feel like it gave our generation specifically um more access and more like oh there are people out here who feel the same way i do i think the same way with like you know fandom i mean like fanfic sites um like ao3 and fan what, fan what fiction dot net. dot net yeah yeah like it's still a site is yeah, it it is, it is hanging in there it is <laughs> it is hanging on by like the very tips of its fingers <laughs> um it was so, like it's dying I'm, in glorious death <laughs> i'm low-key kind of happy i was on tumblr it was such like a very specific time and a specific yeah. era and like I'm also kind of happy it died a little bit because it was kind of like the death of like our child, like our teenage hoods too. Like it was such, it was just an interesting time, but I definitely feel like it was um, a lot of people's very first introductions to queer space online because like, you know, not a lot of people, mm -hmm. especially if you're closeted like anywhere in the world, you could go there and be like, okay, I can be my somewhat self here. There's one mm -hmm. thing you mentioned which I really liked, which I'm going to briefly touch on Reddit for like a little bit because I know not everyone uses or relates to it. But growing up with Reddit, one of the things that's appealing is anonymity. What separates Reddit mm -hmm. and Tumblr from the other social medias is the ability to be anonymous completely. Because yeah, with yeah. Twitter and Facebook, like someone can trace and do weird things because they're selling your info and whatnot. And yeah. find out who you are and potentially expose you or get you in trouble. But in sites like Tumblr and Tumblr and uh, Reddit, you could be fully anonymous 100%. and no one could ever will most likely not figure out you or you unless you state it or accidentally leak a photo yeah. of yourself. Yeah. But these anonymous spaces growing up were so important because it led to finding out and talking to other people who are also anonymous about it. you could have a conversation with a stranger you two will never know who you who you, either of you are most likely but it is still a meaningful conversation that could get you you know skyrocketing to a journey on yourself which is why mm -hmm. i am i'm personally happy that i discovered reddit at a young age granted there's there's a couple unsavory things about reddit yeah and being a reddit yeah. user but for the most part, I was still was exposed to information every day. I was still given reliable sources for this information. So it was definitely helpful. And it's funny because I'm watching Reddit die slowly. So it's yeah. kind of that I imagine it's a similar feeling to how everyone felt when Tumblr kind of we say kick the bucket. It is still around. It's still being used, but it's it made me so sad. sad. I still use it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you're like i'm still with it i am like i literally so on my mission i brought up tumblr one time and my companion at the time was literally like do you think women should shave their arms and i was like what and she goes huh? you're one of those tumblerinas you don't think women should be able to shave their arms do you and i was like <laughs> Is that the, the reputation we have that people shouldn't like women shouldn't be allowed to shave their arms because of feminism? Like, what? It, so that was my experience bringing up Tumblr with like someone in real life uh, who wasn't like a part of my family. Like, what the hell? Um, I I still use Tumblr. Like, I love Tumblr. It's but yeah, like and like I'm gonna be honest. We aren't talking about fandom, but fandom spaces are the spaces where like I first encountered queerness. Um, in a way that I recognized, because we did have neighbors who were a lesbian couple at one time, but, like, I didn't know. Um, no, I have to tell you. You had to tell like, me, they like, were lesbians after we moved out of that apartment. Yeah. Um, but it was fandom spaces and spaces on Tumblr that, like, were like, hey, like, queer people exist, trans people exist, non-binary people exist, like, and Tumblr was the place where, like, I realized that, like, we're just people. 
Because, like, you grow up, especially in the church we grew up in, the Mormon church, like, you're told, like, oh, like, they're sinners, and they're trying to, like, tempt you away, and, like, and they're, like, they're gonna get you. Like, I wrote, I actually wrote a piece about this on my Tumblr, about, like, growing up basically being told that you're in enemy territory during a war. And it was so... I'm not going to say that Tumblr was good for me because there's a lot of stuff that messes you up growing up on the internet with like no internet oversight. But at the same time, like it was good for me in the way that like it taught me a lot of empathy and understanding for a lot of other people that like whose lives are not the same as mine. And it's something I'm still learning because I feel like that's something you learn your whole life. But like it gave me, it gave me a lot of a, a head start, and it gave me, um, it gave me the ability to be more accepting about myself and my own identities when the time came for me to address them. I mean, that's where I basically found out about being reciprocal because I'm just always like, okay, because reciprocal is on this a spectrum of everything, and like reciprocal is where you re- you only experience like romantic attractions to somebody if they are reciprocating back to you. Like, mm-hmm. or anything, I will always be strictly platonic for people. Stuff like that. Like, I will not know that there is romance unless, like, it's literally being told to me, like, hey, like, I have a crush on you and stuff like that. And, like, that's how I found out about it. Like, at first I thought I was lift romantic, which is basically, like, you have no feelings of at all of romantic attraction. But it's like, yeah, I do have romantic attractions, but it's just, like, I don't develop them the way, like, people are like, oh, it's love at first sight. It's like, no, yeah. not for me at all. <laughs> when I found out that people, like, experience love at first sight and, like, sexual attraction at first sight, I was like, who? My my, yeah. my mind was blown. I was like, who are you people? What's going on? Like, Same. oh, my God. Mm-hmm. I, like... One of my friends who happens to be, like, hypersexual, um, I was having a conversation with her one day, and she was like, yeah, I'll literally look at a stranger walking down the street, and I'll be like, yeah, I'd fuck her. Sorry, but you can, like, bleep that out, but, like, yeah, I'd fuck her. And I was like, just walking down that you don't know this person, but you would you would have sex with this person? Like, what? People think like this? What? Yeah, I- it bothered- I, I was like, it- I already knew I was, like, Demi, and I already knew I was on the A spectrum, but I was like, it reaffirms when, like, allosexual people say stuff like that, and I'm like, this is real, like, people actually feel like this. <laughs> it's and so think, weird. Like, and I think, like, a lot of my relationships, like, my past ones, like, when they would ask me out, I think I would just say yes out of niceness. Not because yeah, I actually, yeah. like, had those feelings, and then, like, I would be with them, and I'd be like, I don't know what to do in this relationship, like, yeah. I don't feel any attraction to you at all. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like I'm just people pleasing you at this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, like, I know a lot of asexuals and aromantics, like, feel mm-hmm. about that. And it's yeah. a very common thing, like, because I have a large community of, like, asexuals and aromantics who comment on my videos. Like, I see a lot of people being like, oh, I'd feel bad if I had a partner because I know I'm not going to be sexually attracted to them. And I'd feel bad that they're with someone who doesn't experience that. And it's just like... No, someone who, there. first of all, there are people out there who don't care about, like, sex, so it's okay. Um, but also just, like, if that's important to someone, they just shouldn't be with someone who's ace or on the asexual spectrum. Or, at the very least, if they're interested, ask questions and be like, hey, yo, these are my boundaries, this is what I'm comfortable with, what I'm not, and, like, figure it out together. And if it isn't... If they can't respect that, like, you shouldn't be with them anyway. And, like, I'm, like, honestly really happy that I'm on the asexual spectrum. Like, I can't, Loki, I can't even imagine, like, having sexual feelings and, like, being sexually attracted to people all of the time. Like, that sounds exhausting. I'm not gonna lie. Like, Loki, like, I don't know how y'all do it. But, um, no, yeah. I'm just, like... It doesn't have to be, like, as big of a thing. And, like, asexuals and people, like, don't have to feel bad and shouldn't feel that pressure of, oh, I have to be nice. It's like, no, you don't have to. Yeah, sorry. It's a little asexual rant. <laughs> okay, that's time. Uh, I think we have time for one more subject. Okay. Um, and I'm going to end it on a... Uh, we're still gonna talk about social media, but we're transitioning to different, a different place, really big place. Oh dear. <laughs> um, TikTok is oh. 
is a TikTok. very very controversial platform and i mean that in the sense that almost anything can be uploaded to tiktok that's you know sans all that wonderful stuff but yeah um in tiktok i'm seeing like when i look at tiktok i see pieces of tumblr i see pieces of reddit i see pieces of you know all all social medias really because and it's fascinating because it's it's really the algorithm that does all of it it purposely takes you to places it knows to videos you did knows you want to watch which could also make you end up in places you want to be people have discord links in their bios people have you know places streams that you can watch them and continue to interact with them and interact with other people that you know are of that same space so my question is and because i don't know what the fuck is going on with tumblr nowadays in terms of the mm -hmm. u.s in it but what do you think the future of being queer on social media is do you see us having our own facebook do you see us having our own like variant of tiktok or are we always just going to invade existing platforms I don't like the term invade because it sounds like know, we're in an infestation. I when I said it, I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's not the I'm best. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm about to check you real quick. Um, I think a, as someone who like does social media for a living and like is trying to grow their own platform um, around the queer community, I don't want us to be separate. Like, I don't want that. I want people... Uh, even if they leave hate comments, even if they say they're whatever they say about me, at least they're exposed to a queer person. And that's what I care about. Like, I know for me personally, I've gotten over, like, um, like the hate comments that I get. And honestly, I just think they're kind of funny right now. Like, <laughs> I've gotten to that point where I'm like, oh, it's okay. This homophobia and transphobia and acephobia, like, it's fine. Um, but, like... I don't want to be separate. I want them to know that we're here. We're not going anywhere. You cannot, no matter how hard you try to write bills and pass laws and kill trans people, we're not going anywhere. And you will see us. And I think that's why social media is so important. Because people who would never see a trans person, non-binary person, ace person, bi person, pamp, anything under our beautiful community. Like, in the Midwest, people are homophobic as hell, transphobic as hell. A kid who is experiencing all of that might feel so alone, but they see, like, I'll say Dylan, for example, and seeing her living her life and getting surgeries and being like oh my god i feel the same way i connect to that like there's one person out there who feels the same way i do and i think that's why social media can be so important because you are able to connect to people that you would have never never seen in real life ever like i know for me personally i've learned a whole lot more about like um like, the POC side of the queer community, too, because of the people that I follow and, like, wanting to educate myself and making sure that, like, I'm a good white queer person, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, like, <laughs> making sure we educate ourselves. But, like, I would have never been exposed to the people that I follow if I wasn't on social media. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't want us to be separated. I... We belong here. We're not going anywhere. People need to see us. I think I, I think I think I kind of understand why I said invade, and it's still a bad choice of word. But I think I say it because a lot of these social media algorithms tend to push queer content away, they do. or at least it pushes yeah. us <laughs> to users that do not want to see our. That's why hate comments exist. Yeah. Hate comments exist because yeah. we are appearing on you know hateful people's feeds and that's why mm -hmm. they see it they get mad and or they're intentionally looking for it to to do hate Be, content, yep yeah which also i get people like them. that i yeah. get people like that <laughs> like people that search for it and you know have the spare time and the audacity to do that it's like all right well you do you i guess but for the most part i'm like you're watching me that says more about you than yeah. it does about me yeah 
Plus, like, if you have your own, like, queer website or, like, platform, you can easily just censor it. So why would you yeah. want more censorship compared to yeah. wanting to be visibly seen? Exactly. Like, like how Lynn was saying, I want to see those queer spaces. Yeah. And stuff like that. Like, being explicitly talked about. I want to see more people that are, like, closeted or, like, people that are scared of, like, their family values to be able to talk about their experiences. Yeah. And, like, be able to be brave enough to be like, okay... Like, there's a group of people that are similar like me, have the same experiences, that are still going through what they are, even at this age. Like, as a young minor, as, like, a, ch- a young child, I would be like, wow, they're still going through this, but they're still persevering in life. Like, nothing's going to stop them. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if we have separate platforms, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because then you can have the conservatives be like, I don't want no block band. Yeah. yeah. I think talking about, like, the future of... Um, queer social, like queer people on social media, the queer community on social media is like, like Rowan was touching on, like talking about censorship mm-hmm. and moving forward with that um, because there are so many laws that are like being discussed now and bills that are being discussed. They're like, oh, we need to censor pornographic material and inappropriate material for minors and things like that. They are going to lump us in with that stuff like so it's something that i've been keeping an eye on because like if you can ban inappropriate content you can define inappropriate content as whatever the heck you want it to be and queer people and people who don't fit into the cis heteronormative um, system that's been built, the white system that's been built, the able-bodied system that's been built, like we are the first people that get censored when censorship comes from in- inappropriate materials to real-life communities and things like that. Like, you look at people who, like, have struggled on TikTok, um, especially, like, black people, people of color, um, queer people of color, black queer people, um, struggling just to get their content seen and like it's not like an explicit like oh we're we're like banning all you know people of color and queer people of color from making videos but it's like it's like those um i don't know what the term for it is but basically like the algorithm kind of like shadow ban like shadow like, ban. like shadow ban. Saying, yeah. yeah shadow banning there we go shadow banning and like it starts with shadow banning and then like i i sound i feel like i sound kind of paranoid when i say that but it's like <laughs> shadow banning no it, and, like, it's, it's actually like a real thing it's okay. it's genuinely a thing that happens to to those kinds of content creators it, it yeah genuinely so happens like i feel like it starts with shadow banning and then like when the shadow banning is successful then people are like oh like we can do it in our bills and our laws in our schools and stuff like that so i feel like what y'all said is so important. Like we aren't, we can't go anywhere because if we do, they're just going to ban wherever we go. Yeah. Like they're going to, we, we, I feel like we have to stay wherever, like, yes, we want to make queer, like safe spaces for ourselves, but at the same time, like we need to be in the public, um, like general social media sphere with cis het people, with the conservative people, because otherwise they're just going to push us out. And like, I am, these days I'm running on spite, y'all. I'm just like, y'all better, you better bet I'm having my best life here because you don't want me to kind of a thing. Like, I feel yeah. like, I feel like that's how I feel about this whole social media thing is like, you better bet I'm going to be on social media. I'm going to be making my like disruptive videos, my videos about, about queer joy and trans joy and all that stuff, because like, you don't want to see it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm running on spite at this point, pure spite. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we're all very strong individuals that will refuse to back down in case of whatever happens. And as someone who is already shadow banned on Facebook, well, I've been for a few years, but yeah, it's it's like, you know, I might be shadow banned, but I'm still here and I'm still like trying. And I know the people that matter will see whatever I post, whatever I share. So that's what really counts, you know, one day someone will see like some of the other content and I already know I help my I help my niece find their identity, so I'm hoping that not even just me, but that any of us can help anyone find their identity, regardless yeah. if you're a heavy poster, regardless if you're not a heavy poster. Mm-hmm. 
Well, in any case, I think that about wraps this up. We wrap. We end on a. We also managed to end on a hopeful note. Stop. Like, I'm really happy about. Oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I want to thank. We you love all for pride. Being here. Yeah. I want to thank you all for putting up with the last minute session. It's all good. My pizza. <laughs> You're like, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got this man in the back. He's waiting. <laughs> My system forming. He ain't holding pizza. He's <laughs> <laughs> holding a cat. Oh, okay. Even better. <laughs> well, I hope I'll see you all next time on another episode of whatever I decide to do. But in any yeah. case, goodbye, everyone. Uh, bye.